when shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. That will be ere the set of sun. Where the place? Upon the heath. There to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grey Malkin. Paddock calls. Come on. Fair is foul and foul is fair. Over through the fog and filth the air. Now who comes here? The worthy Thane of Ross. What a haste looks through his eyes. So should he looks that seems to speak things strange. God save the king. Once camest thou, worthy Thane? From Fife, great king. Where the Norwayan banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict. Till brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point rebellious, arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit. And to conclude, the victory fell on us. Ah, great happiness! That now Sueno, the Norway's king, craves composition. Nor would we deign him burial of his men, till he disbursed at St. Combs Inch ten thousand dollars to our general use. No more that Thane of Cawdor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go, pronounce his present death, and with his former titles, greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine. Sister, where thou? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap, and mounched and mounched and mounched. Give me, quoth I, a roint thee, witch, the rump-fed Runyon cries. Her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger. But in a sieve I'll thither sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do. I'll give thee a wind, and I another. I will drain him dry as hay. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live a man forbid. His bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest-tossed. Look what I have. Oh, show me, show me. Here I have a pilot's thumb, wrecked as homeward he did come. A drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. The weird sisters, hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, thus to go about, about, thrice to thine, and thrice to mine, and thrice to him, to make up nine. Peace, the charms wound up. So foul. And fair a day I have not seen. How far is called to forest? What are these? So withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are on not Leave you! Or are you aught that man may question? You seem to understand me by each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be women. And yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak, if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glams. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor. All hail, Macbeth. Thou shalt be king hereafter. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? In the name of truth, are ye fantastical? Or that indeed which outwardly you show? My noble partner you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. To me you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favours nor your hate. Hail, 
Hail! Hail! Lesser than Macbeth, and greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth, all hail. Stay, you imperfect speakers, tell me more. By Sinel's death I know I'm Thane of Glams, but how of Cawdor? The Thane of Cawdor lives, a prosperous gentleman. And to be king stands not within the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cawdor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence. Or why upon this blasted heath you stop our way with such prophetic greeting? Speak. I charge you! The earth hath bubbles, as the water has, and these are of them. Whither are they vanished? Into the air. And what seemed corporal melted as breath into the wind. Would well, they had stayed? Were such things here as we do speak about? Or have we eaten on the insane road that takes the reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. You shall be king. And Thane of Cawdor too, when did not so. To the self-same tune and words. Who's here? King hath happily received Macbeth the news of thy success. As thick as hail came post with post, and every one did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defence and poured them down before him. We are sent to give thee from our royal master thanks, only to herald thee into his sight, not pay thee. And for an earnest of greater honour, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cawdor, in which addition hail, most worthy Thane, for it is thine. What can the devil speak through? The Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane lives yet, but under heavy sentence bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those of Norway, or did line the rebel with hidden help and vantage, or that with both he laboured in his country's wreck, I know not. But treason's capital, confessed and proved, have overthrown him. Clams and Thane of Cawdor. The greatest is behind. Thanks for your pains. Do you not hope your children shall be kings, when those that gave the Thane of Cawdor to me promised no less to them? That trusted home might yet enkindle you unto the crown, besides the Thane of Cawdor. But tis strange, and oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles, to betray us in deepest consequence. Cousin's word, I pray you, Two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. I thank you, gentlemen. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill. Cannot be good. If ill, why hath it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cawdor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise. And nothing is but what is not. Look how our partners wrapped. If chance will have me king, why, chance may crown me without my stir. New honours come upon him, like our strange garments, cleave not to their mould, but with the aid of use. Come what come may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Mm, give me your favour. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let us toward the king. And at more time, the interim having waited, let us speak our free hearts each to other. Very gladly. Till then, enough. Come, friends. Is execution done on Cordo? Are not those in commission yet returned? My liege, they are not yet come back. But I have spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that, very frankly, he confessed his treasons, implored your highness pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death, to throw away the dearest thing he owed as twere a careless trifle. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. 
He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. My worthiest cousin. The sin of my ingratitude even now was heavy upon me. Thou art so far before, that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Would thou hadst less deserved, that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is I due than more than all can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your Highness parted to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. Welcome hither. I have begun to plant thee, and shall labor to make thee full of growing. <laughs> Noble Banquo, that has no less deserved, nor must be known no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee, and hold thee to my heart. There, if I grow, the harvest is your own. My plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Sons, kinsmen, thanes, and you whose places are the nearest, know we will establish our estate upon our eldest, Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland, which honors must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shine upon all deservers. From hence to Inverness, <laughs> and bind us further to you. The rest is labor which is not used for you. I'll be myself the harbinger, and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach. So humbly take my leave. My worthy Cordor. Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down. Or else, or leap. But in my way it lies. Stars hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand. But let that be which the eye fears when it is done. To see. True worthy Banquo. He is full so valiant. And in his commendation I am fed. It is a banquet to me. Let's after him whose care is gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. They met me in the day of success. And I have learned by the perfectest report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air, into which they vanished. While as I stood wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives from the king, who all hailed me, Thane of Cordor. By which title before these weird sisters saluted me, and referred me to the coming on of time with hail that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightest not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. Glams thou art, and Cordor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that thou wouldst holily. Wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirit in thine ear and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. 
Is not thy master with him? Who worked so would have informed for preparation. So please you, it is true. Arsene is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him, who, almost dead from breath, had scarcely more than would make up his message. Give him tending. He brings great news. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. You spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose. Nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pour thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, Hold, hold! Great glance, worthy Cordor. Greater than both by the all hail hereafter. <laughs> Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matter. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for. And you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch which shall to all our days and nights to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. We will speak further. Only look up clear. To alter favour ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. This castle hath a pleasant seat. The air, sweetly and nimbly, recommends itself unto our gentle senses. This guest of summer, the temple-haunting Martlet, does approve by his loved mansionry that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. No jutty, frieze, buttress, nor coin of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle. Where they most breed and haunt, I have observed, the air is delicate. See. See, our honoured hostess. The love that follows us sometime is our trouble, which we still thank as love. Herein I teach you how you should bid God us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. All our service in every point, twice done and then done double, were poor and single business to contend against those honours deep and broad, wherewith your majesty loads our house. For those of old, and for the late dignities heaped up to them, we rest your hermits. Where's the Thane of Cordor? We cost him at the heel and had a purpose to be his purveyor. But he rides well, and his great love, sharp as a spur, hath helped him to his home before us. <laughs> Fair and honoured hostess, we are your guests tonight. Your servants ever have theirs themselves and what is theirs in compt to make their audit at your highness pleasure, still to return your own. Give me your hand. Conduct me to mine host. We love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess. If 
it were done, when tis done, and twere well it were done, quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here. That we but teach bloody instruction, which being taught returns to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. <laughs> He's here in double trust. First, as I'm his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. Then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek have been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off, and pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition which all leaps itself and falls on the other. How <laughs> ah, now, what news? He has almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? No, you not, he has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honoured me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since? And wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time, such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemst the ornament of life? And live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would like the poor cat in the adage? I prithee, peace! I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more than man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves. And that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck and know how tender it is to nurse the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. If we should fail... We fail! But screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail! <laughs> When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his hard day's journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory, the warder to the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbeck only. When in swinish sleep their drenched nature lies as in a death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers? who shall bear the guilt of our great quell. Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers that they have done? To who dares receive it, other, as we shall make our griefs and clamour roar upon his death? I am settled, and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feed. Away, and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. <laughs> Ah, 
How goes the night, boy? The moon is down. I have not heard the clock. She goes down at twelve. I take this later, sir. Hold. Take my sword. There's husbandry in heaven. The candles are all out. Take me that too. If he summons lies like lead upon me, and yet I would not sleep. Merciful powers, restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. In my sword. Is there a friend? What, sir, not yet at rest? The king's abed. He hath been in unusual pleasure and sent forth great largesse to your offices. This diamond he greets your wife withal by the name of most kind hostess and shut up in measureless content. Being unprepared, our will became the servant to defect, which else should free have wrought. All's well. I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. To you, they have showed some truth. I think not of them. Yet when we can entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon that business, if you would grant the time. At your kind pleasure. If you shall cleave to my consent when tis, it shall make honour for you. So I lose none in seeking to augment it, but still keep my bosom franchised and allegiance clear. I shall be counselled. Hmm. Good repose the while. Thanks, sir. The like to you. Go, bid thy mistress when my drink is ready, she strike upon the bell. Get thee to bed. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand? Come. Let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain? I see thee yet, in form as palpable as this, which now I draw. Thou marshalst me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. I see thee, still, and on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes. Now, o'er the one half world, nature seems dead and wicked dreams abuse the curtained sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings, and withered murder, alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls his watch, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm said earth, hear not my steps which way they walk. For fear thy very stones prate of my whereabout and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. Whilst I threat, he lives. Words to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven. To hell. That which hath made them drunk hath made me bold. What hath quenched them hath given me fire. Hark. Peace. 
It was the owl that shrieked. The fatal bellman that gives the sternest good night. He is about it. The doors are open, and the surfeited grooms do mock their charge with snores. I have dragged their possets, that death and nature do contend about them, whether they live or die. And like, I am afraid they have awaked and tis not done. The attempt and not the deed confounds us. Hark! I laid their daggers ready, he could not miss them. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. I've done the deed. Oh. Did I not hear a noise? I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did not you speak? When? Now. As I descended. I. Hark! <laughs> Who lies at the second chamber? Donald Bain. This is a sorry sight. A foolish thought to say a sorry sight. There's one did laugh in sleep and one cried murder, but they did wake each other. I stood and heard them, but they did say their prayers and addressed them again to sleep. There are two lodged together. One cried, God bless us, and amen the other. As they'd seen me with these hangman's hands, listening their fear, I could not say amen when they did say God bless us. Consider it not so deeply. Wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I'd most need a blessing and amen stuck in my throat. These deeds must not be thought after this way, so it will make us mad. Methought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep, the innocent sleep. Sleep that knits up the ravel sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, sore labour's bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. What do you mean? Still it cried, sleep no more to all the house. Glams hath murdered sleep, and therefore Corder shall sleep no more. Macbeth shall sleep no more. Who was it that thus cried? Why, worthy thing, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brain sickly of such things. Go, get some water. And wash this filthy witness from your hands. Why did you bring these daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go, carry them. And smear the sleepy grooms with blood. I'll go no more. I'm afraid to think on what I've done. Look on again, I dare not. Then firm of purpose. Give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. Tis the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. Whence is that knocking? Oh, it's with me whenever a noise appalls me. What hands are these? They pluck out mine eyes. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No. This my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine. Making the green one red. My hands are of your colour. But I shame to wear a heart so what? I hear a knocking at the south entry. But are we to our chamber? A little water clears us of this deed. How easy is it then? Your constancy has left you unattended. More knocking. Get on your nightgown, lest occasion call us and show us to be watchers. Be not lost so poorly in your thoughts. To know my deed, to best not know myself. Wake, Duncan, with thy knocking. I would thou couldst. a knocking indeed. If a man were porter of Elgate, he should have all turned the key. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there in the name of Beelzebub? 
He is a farmer that hanged himself on the expectation of plenty. Come in time, have napkins in our about you. Here you'll sweat for it. Knock, knock, who's there? Faith, he is an equivocator that could swear in both the scales against either scale, who committed treason enough for God's sake, yet could not equivocate to heaven. Oh, could be an equivocator. Knock, 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 who's there? Faith, here's an English tailor come hither for stealing out a French hose. Come in, tailor, here you may roast your goose. Knock, knock, never a quiet. What are you? Phew, this place is too cold for hell. I'll devil porter it no further. I had hoped to a let in some of all professions that go the primrose way to the everlasting bonfire. And none, none, none! I pray you remember the porter. <laughs> Was it so late, friend, how you went to bed that you do lie so late? Faith, sir, we were carousing till the second cock. Ah. And drink, mm. sir, is a great provoker of three things. Oh. <laughs> what three things does drink especially provoke? Marry, sir, nose paint in sleep and urine. <laughs> <laughs> Lechery, sir. It yeah. provokes and unprovokes. Mm. It... it, it Provokes the desire and takes away the performance. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, much drink may be said to be an equivocator with lechery. It makes him and it mars him. It sets him on and it takes him off. It persuades him and disheartens him. It makes him stand to and not stand to. <laughs> in conclusion, it equivocates him in a sleep and giving him the lie leaves him. Mm, I believe drink gave thee the lie last night. Eh? <laughs> that it did, sir, in the very throat on me. But I requited him for his lie, and I think being too strong for him, uh, though he took up my legs some time, <laughs> yet I made a shift to cast him. <laughs> <laughs> Is thy master stirring? Yeah. Oh, our knocking has awaked him. Here he comes. Good morrow, noble sir. Good morrow, both. Is the king stirring, worthy Thane? Not yet. Oh, he did command me to call timely on him. I'd almost slipped the hour. I'll bring you to him. I know this is a joyful trouble to you, but yet tis one. The labour we delight in physics pain. <laughs> this is the door. I'll make so bold to call, for tis my limited service. Goes the king hence today? He does. He did appoint, sir. The night has been unruly. Where we lay, our chimneys were blown down. And as they say, lamentings heard in the air, strange screams of death and prophesying with accents tellable of dire combustion and confused events new hatch to the woeful time. The obscure bird clamoured the livelong night. Some say the earth was feverous and did shake. It was a rough night. My young remembrance cannot parallel a fellow to it. Horror. 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 Tangino, I cannot conceive nor name thee. What's the matter? Confusion now hath made his masterpiece. Most sacrilegious murder hath broke out the Lord's anointed temple and stole thence the life of the building. What is to say the life? Mean you, His Majesty. Approach the chamber and destroy your sight with a new gorgon. Well, do not bid me speak. See and then speak yourselves. Awake! Awake! Ring the alarm bell! Murder and treason! Back while and Donald made Malcolm awake! Shake off this downy sleep death's counterfeit and look on death itself! Up, up and see the great doom's image! Malcolm Banquo! And from your graves rise up and walk like sprites to countenance this horror! What's the business of such a hideous trumpet calls to parley the sleepers of the house? Speak, speak! Gentle lady, it is not for you to hear what I can speak! The repetition in a woman's ear would murder as it fell! Oh, Banquo, Banquo! Our royal master's murdered! Whoa, alas! Why, 
not in our house! Too cruel anywhere! Dear Duff, I pray thee contradict thyself and say it is not so. Had I ever died an hour before this chance, I'd lived a blessed time. For from this instant there's nothing serious in mortality. All is but toys. Renown and grace is dead, the wine of life is drawn, and the mere lees is left this vault to brag of. What is amiss? You are and do not know it. The spring, the head, the fountain of your blood is stopped. The very source of it is stopped. Your royal father is murdered. For oh, by whom? Those of his chamber, as it seemed, had done it. Their hands and faces were all badged with blood. So were their daggers, which unwiped we found upon their pillows. They stared and were distracted. No man's life was to be trusted with them. <laughs> oh, yet I do repent me in my fury that I did kill them. But wherefore did you so? Who can be wise, amazed, temperate and furious, loyal and neutral in a moment? No man. The expedition of my violent love outran the pause of reason. Here lay Duncan, his silver skin laced with his golden blood, and his gashed stabs looked like a breach in nature for ruin's wasteful entrance. There the murderers, steeped in the colours of their trade, their daggers unmanly breached with gore. Who could refrain that had a heart to love, and in that heart courage to make his love known? Help me, help oh, look to the lady. Oh. Why do we hold our tongues that most may claim this argument for ours? It should be spoken here, where our fate, hid in an auger hole, may rush and seize us. It's away, our tears are not yet brewed. Nor our strong sorrow upon the foot of motion. Look to the lady. And when we have our naked frailties hid with suffering exposure, let us meet and question this most bloody piece of work and know it further. Fears and scruples shake us. In the great hand of God I stand, and thence, against the undivulged pretense, I fight of treasonous malice. And so do I. Saul! Let's briefly put on manly readiness and meet in the hall together. Well contented. What will you do? Let's not consort with them. To show an unfelt sorrow is an office which the false man does easy. Ah, to England. To Ireland, I. Our separated fortune shall keep us both the safer. Where we are, there's daggers in men's smiles. The nearer in blood, the nearer bloody. This murderer's shaft that shot hath not yet lighted, and our safest ways to avoid the aim. Therefore to horse, and let us not be dainty of leave-taking, but shift away. There's warrant in that theft which steals itself. When there's no mercy left, score and ten I can remember well, within the volume of which time I've seen hours dreadful and things strange. But this sore night hath trifled for my knowing. Ah, good father, thou seest the heavens as troubled by man's act, threaten his bloody stage. By the clock tis day, and yet dark night strangles the travelling lamp. This night's predominance or the day's shame that darkness does the face of earth entomb when living light should kiss it? It is unnatural. Hmm. E'en like the deed that's done. On Tuesday last year, a falcon, towering in a pride of place, was by a mousing owl hawked at and killed. And Duncan's horses, a thing most strange and certain, beauteous and swift, the minions of their race, Turned wild in nature, broke their stalls, flung out, contending against obedience as they would make war with mankind. It is said they ate each other. Oh, they did so. To the amazement of my eyes that looked upon. Here comes the good Macduff. How goes the world, sir, now? Why, see you not. Hmm. Is known who did this more than bloody deed? Those that Macbeth hath slain. Alas, the day. What good could they pretend? They were suborned. And Malcolm and Donalbane, the king's two sons, are stolen away and fled, which puts upon them suspicion of the deed. Against nature still. Thriftless ambition that will raven up thine own life's means. 
Then tis most like the sovereignty will fall upon Macbeth. He is already named and gone to Schoon to be invested. Where is Duncan's body? Carried to Combekill, the sacred storehouse of his predecessors and guardian of their bones. Will you to Schoon? No, cousin. Out of five. Well, I will thither. Well, may you see things well done there. And you, lest our old robes sit easier than our new. Farewell, Father. God's benison go with you. And with those that would make good of bad and friends of foes. Thou hast it now, King, Cawdor, Glams, all, as the weird women promised. And yet I fear thou playedst most foully for it. Yet it was said it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there come truth from them, as upon thee, Macbeth, their speeches shine, why, by the verities on thee made good, may they not be my oracles as well and set me up in hope? Shh. No more. Here's our chief guest. If he had been forgotten, it had been as a gap in our great feast, and all thing unbecoming. Tonight we hold a solemn supper, sir, and I'll request your presence. Let your highness command upon me, to the which my duties are with a most indissoluble tie for ever knit. Ride you this afternoon. Aye, my good lord. We should have else desired your good advice, which still hath been both grave and prosperous in this day's council. But we'll take tomorrow. Miss Far, you ride. As far, my lord, as we'll fill up the time twixt this and supper. Go not my horse the better. I must become a borrower of the night for a dark hour or twain. <laughs> Fail not our feast. My lord, it will not. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide, filling their hearers with strange invention. But of that tomorrow. When therewithal we shall have cause of state craving us jointly. Hie you to horse. Adieu till you return at night. The ghost of Fleance with you. Aye, my good lord. Our time does call upon us. I wish your horse is swift and sure of foot, and so I do commend you to their backs. Farewell. Let every man be master of his time till seven at night. To make society the sweeter welcome, we will keep ourselves till supper time alone. While then, God be with you. Sirrah, a word with you. Attend those men our pleasure. They are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us. Thus is nothing, but to be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep, and in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. It is much he dares, and to that dauntless temper of his mind he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valour to act in safety. There's none but he whose being I do fear, and under him my genius is rebuked as it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters when first they put the name of king upon me and bade them speak to him. And prophet-like they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my gripe, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. If be so, for Banquo's issue have I filed my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered. Put rancors in the vessel of my peace. Only for them. And my eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man. 
to make them kings. The seed of Banquo kings. Rather than so, come fate into the list and champion me to the utterance. Hold here! Who's there? I'll go to the door and stay there till we call. Was it not yesterday we spoke together? It was, so please, Your Highness. Well, then, now have you considered of my speeches? I know that it was he in the times past which held you so under fortune, which you had thought had been our innocent self. This I made good to you in our last conference. You made it known to us. I did so and went further, which is now our point of second meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Are you so gospel to pray for this good man and for his issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever? We are men, my liege. Aye. In the catalogue you go for men. As hounds and greyhounds, mongrels, spaniels, curs, shafts, water rugs and demi-wolves are clept all by the name of dogs. But... Now, if you have a station in the file not in the worst rank of manhood, say it. And I will put that business in your bosoms whose execution takes your enemy off. Grapples you to the heart and love of us, who wear our health but sickly in his life, which in his death were perfect. I am one, my liege, whom the vile blows and buffets of the world have so incensed that I am reckless what I do to spite the world. I lie another, so weary with disaster, and tug with fortune. I would set my life on any chance to mend it or be rid of it. Both of you know Banquo was your enemy. True, my lord. So is he mine. And in such bloody distance that every minute of his being thrusts against my nearest of life. And though I could with bare-faced power sweep him from my sight and bid my will avouch it, yet I must not. Uh, for certain friends that are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop. But wail his fall, who I myself struck down. And thence it is that I to your assistance do make love, masking the business from the common eye for sundry weighty reasons. We will perform, my liege, what you command us. Though our lives... Your spirit shines through you. Within this hour, at most, I will advise you where to plant yourselves, acquaint you with a perfect spy of the time, the very moment, aunt, for it must be done tonight and something from the palace. Always thought that I require a clearness. And with him, to leave no rubs nor botches i' the work, Fleance his son that keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than is his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Resolve yourselves apart, I'll come to you anon. We are resolved, my lord. I'll call upon you straight. Abide within. It is concluded. Banquo, thy soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. Is Banquo gone from court? Aye, madam, but returns again tonight. Say to the king, I would attend his leisure for a few words. Madam, I will. Lord's had. All spent where our desire is got without content. It is safer to be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. Why do you keep alone? Of sorriest fancies your companions making, using those thoughts which should indeed have died with them they think on. Things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. We've scorched the snake, not killed it. She'll close and be herself, whilst our poor malice remains in danger of her former tooth. But let the frame of things disjoint. Both the world suffer, ere we may eat our meal in fear and sleep in the affliction of these terrible dreams which shake us nightly. Better be with the dead, whom we, to gain our peace, have sent to peace, than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst. Nor steel, nor poison, and malice domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. Come on. 
Gentle, my lord. Sleek o'er your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. <laughs> so shall I, love, and so I pray be you. Let your remembrance apply to Banquo. Present him eminence both with eye and tongue. Unsafe the while that we must lave our honours in these flattering streams and make our faces visits to our hearts, disguising what they are. You must leave this! Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Thou knowest that Banquo and his fleans lives. But in their nature's copy is not eternal. There's comfort yet, they are assailable. Then be thou jocund. Ere the bat hath flown his cloistered flight, ere to black Hecate summons the shard-born beetle with his drowsy hums hath rung night's yawning peal, there shall be done a deed of dreadful note. What's to be done? Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applaud the deed. Come, sealing night. Scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day, and with thy bloody and invisible hand, cancel! and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale. Light thickens, and the crow makes wings to the rooky wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, whilst night's black agents to their praise do rouse. Thou marvelst at my words, but hold thee still. Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. So prithee, Go with me. The west yet glimmers with some streaks of day. Now spurs the later traveller apace, to gain the timely inn, and near approaches the subject of our watch. What? Oh, I hear horses. We shall light their home. And tis he. The rest within the note of expectation already are at the court. His horses go about. Almost a mile. But he does usually, so all men do, from hence to the palace gate make it their walk. Hark! A light! A light! Stand to it! Will be rain tonight. Let it come down! Oh! Treachery! Fly, good friends! Fly! Fly! The mist remains! <gasps> Slave! What is drag out the light? What's that the way? There's but one down, the sun is fled. We've lost best half of our affair. Well, let's away. I'll say how much is done. You know your own degrees. Sit down. At first and last, a hearty welcome. Thanks, Your, Thanks Majesty. Your Majesty. Ourself will mingle with society and play the humble host. Our hostess keeps her state, but in best time we will require her welcome. Pronounce it for me, sir, to all our friends. For my heart speaks they are welcome. See, they encounter thee with our heart's thanks. Both sides are even. Here I'll sit in the midst. Be large in mirth. Mm. Anon we'll drink a measure of the table round. Ah. <laughs> Blood upon thy face. Tis Banquo's then. Tis better he without than he within. Is he dispatched? My lord, his throat is cut. That I did for him. Thou art the best of the cutthroats. Yet he's good that did the like for Fleance. If thou didst it, thou art a non parel. That's royal, sir. Fleance is escaped. And comes my fit again. Had else been perfect. Whole as the marble, founded as the rock. As broad and general as the casing air. But now I'm cabined, cribbed, confined, bound into saucy doubts and fears. But Banco's safe. Ah, oh, my good lord. Safe in a ditch he bides. With twenty trenched gashes in his head, the least. A death to nature. Thanks for that. There the grown serpent lies. The worm that's fled hath nature that in time will venom breed. No teeth for the present. Get thee gone. Tomorrow we'll hear ourselves again. My royal lord, you do not give the cheer. The feast is sold that is not often vouched while tis a making, tis given with welcome. <laughs> to feed were best at home, from thence the source to meet his ceremony. Meeting were bare without it. Sweet remembrance, sir. Now good digestion wait on appetite, and health on both. May it please your highness sit. Here had we now our country's honour roofed with a graced person of our banquo present. 
whom I may rather challenge for unkindness than pity for mischance. His absence sir lays blame upon his promise. Please your royal highness to grace us with your company. The table's full. Here is a place reserved, sir. Where? Here, my good lord. What is that moves, your highness? Which of you have done this? What, my good lord? I canst not say I did it. Never shed thy gory locks at me. Gentlemen, rise, his highness is not well. Sit, worthy friends. My lord is often thus and hath been from his youth. Pray you, keep seat. If the fit is momentary, upon a thought he will again be well. If much you note him, you shall offend him and extend his passion. Feed and regard him not. Are you a man? Aye, and a bold one that dare look on that which might appall the devil. Oh, proper stuff. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air-drawn dagger which you said led you to Duncan. Oh, these flaws and starts, impostors to true fear, would well become a woman's story at a winter's fire authorised by a grand um, <laughs> Shame itself. Why do you make such faces? When all's done, you look but on a stool. I prithee, behold, look fair. <laughs> well, what say you? What care I? If thou canst not, speak too. If charnel houses and our graves must send those we bury back, our monument shall be the moors of kites. Oh, quite unmanned in folly. If I stand here, I saw him. I for shame. The time has been that when the brains were out, the man would die and there an end. But now they rise with twenty mortal murders on their crowns and push us from our stools. This is my, more strange than such a murder is. My worthy lord, your noble friends do lack you. I do forget. Do not muse at me, my most worthy friends. I have a strange infirmity which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and health to all. Then I'll sit down. Give me some wine. I feel full. I drink to the general joy of the whole table and to our dear friend Banquo, whom we miss. Would he were here. To all in him we thirst. And all to all. Our duties and the pledge. Avant! And quit my sight! Let the earth hide thee! Thy bones are marrowless, thy blood is cold. Thou hast no speculation in those eyes which thou dost glare with. Think of this good peers, but as a thing of custom, tis no more. Only it spoils the pleasure of the time. What man dare I dare? Approach thou like the rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros, or the Hurkan tiger. Take any shape but that, and my firm nerves will never tremble. Or be alive again, and dare me to the desert with thy sword. If trembling I inhabit, then protest me the baby of a girl. Hence, horrible shadow, unreal mockery, hence! Why so? Being gone, I am a man again. I pray you sit still. You have displaced the mirth, broke the good meeting with most admired disorder. Can such things be, and overcome us like a summer's cloud without our special wonder? You do make me strange, even to the disposition that I owe. When now I think you can behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks when mine is blanched with fear. What sights, my lord? I pray you, speak not. He grows worse and worse. Question enrages him at once. Good night. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Good night. And better health attend his majesty. A kind good night to all. It will have blood. They say blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Augures and understood relations have by maggot pies and chuffs and rooks brought forth a secret man of blood. What is the night? Almost at odds with morning. Which is which? How sayest thou that Macduff denies his person at our great bidding? Did you send to him, sir? I heard it by the way, but I will send. 
There's not a one of them, and in his house I keep a servant feed. I will tomorrow. And betimes I will to the weird sisters. More shall they speak. For now I am bent to know by the worst means the worst. For mine own good. All causes shall give way. I am in blood stepped in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as go o'er. Strange things I have in head that will to hand, which must be acted, ere they may be scanned. You lack the season of all natures. Sleep. Come, will to sleep. This strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that once hard use. We are yet but young in deed. My former speeches have but hit your thoughts, which can interpret further. Only I say, things have been strangely born. The gracious Duncan was pitied of Macbeth. Marry, he was dead. And the right valiant Banquo walked too late. Whom you may save to please you. Fleance killed, for Fleance fled. Men must not walk too late. Who cannot want the thought how monstrous it was for Malcolm and for Donalbane to kill their gracious father? Damn it, fact. How it did grieve Macbeth. Did he not straight in pious rage the two delinquents tear? that were the thralls of sleep and slaves of drink. Was that not nobly done? Ah, and wisely too, for it would have angered any heart alive to hear the men deny it. So that I say he has borne all things well. And I do think that had he Duncan's sons under his key, as, and please heaven, he shall not, they should find what twere to kill a father. So should Fleance. But peace. Or from broad words, and because he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast, I hear Macduff lives in disgrace. Sir, can you tell where he bestows himself? The son of Duncan, from whom this tyrant holds the due of birth, lives in the English court, and is received of the most pious Edward with such grace that the malevolence of fortune nothing takes from his high respect. Thither Macduff is gone to pray the Holy King upon his aid to wake Northumberland and the warlike Seward, that by the help of these, with him above to ratify the work, we may again give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights, free from our feasts and banquets bloody knives, do faithful homage and receive free honors, all which we pine for now. And this report hath so exasperate the king that he prepares for some attempt of war. Sent he to Macduff? He did, and with an absolute, sir, not I. The cloudy messenger turns me his back and, ha, as who should say, you'll rue the time that clogs me with this answer. That well might advise him to a caution to hold what distance his wisdom can provide. Some holy angel fly to the court of England and unfold his message ere he come, that a swift blessing may soon return to this our suffering country under a hand accursed. I'll send my prayers with him. Brinded cat hath mewed. Thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Happier cries, tis time, tis time. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Told that under cold stone, days and nights as thirty one, sweltered venom sleeping got. Boil thou first in the charmed pot. Double, double, double toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron, bubble. Fill it 
of a fenny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. I a mutant toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and howlet's wing. For a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. Toil and trouble, fire, burn, burn and cauldron, bubble. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, witch's mummy, maw and gulf of the ravine, salt sea shark. Root of hemlock, dig to the dark. Liver of blaspheming Jew, gall of goat. And slips of you, slivered on the moon's eclipse. Nose of tech and tatter's lip. Finger of birth strangled babe. Bitch delivered by a drab. Make the gruel thick and slab. Add thereto a tiger's children for the ingredients of our cauldron. Double, double toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Cool it with a baboon's blood. Then the charm is firm and good. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Open locks, whoever knocks. How oh, now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is you do? A deed without a name. I conjure you, by that which you profess, however you come to know it, answer me. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, though yeasty waves confound and swallow navigation up, though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, though castles topple on their warders' heads, though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations, that the treasure of nature's germins tumble altogether, even till destruction sicken. Answer me to what I ask you. Speak, demand. We'll answer. Say, if that's rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters. Call them. Let me see them. Pour in sow's blood that hath eaten her nine farrow. Grease that's sweating from the murderer's gibbet pour into the flame. Come, high or low, thyself and office deathly show. Tell me, thou unknown power. He knows thy thought. Hear his speech, but say thou naught. Macbeth, Macbeth. Macbeth, beware Macduff, beware the thane of Fife. Dismiss me, enough. Whate'er thou art, for thy good caution, thanks. Thou hast harped my fear right. But one word more. He will not be commanded. Here's another, more potent than the first. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Had I three years, I'd hear thee. Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man. For none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Then live, Macduff. What need I fear of thee? And yet I'll make assurance double sure, and take a bond of fate. Thou shalt not live, that I may sleep in spite of fear, and sleep in spite of thunder. What is this that rises like the issue of a king and wears upon his baby brow the round and top of sovereignty? Listen, but speak not to it. Be lion mettled, proud, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquished be until great Burner Wood to high Dunsinan Hill shall come against him. That will never be. Who can impress the forest, bid the tree unfix his earthbound root? Sweet Bodements, good. Rebellious dead, 
Rise never till the wood of Burnham rise, and our high-placed Macbeth shall live the lease of nature, pay his breath to time and mortal custom. Yet my heart throbs to know one thing. Tell me if your art can tell so much. Shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom? Seek to know no more. I will be satisfied. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you. Let me know. I sinks that cauldron. What noise is this? Show! 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 Show, Show his eyes and grieve his heart. Come like shadows, so depart. Thou art too like the spirit of Banquo. Down, thy crown doth sear mine eyeballs, and thy hair, thou other gold bound brow, is like the first, the third is like the former. Filthy hags, why do you show me this? A fourth? Starred eyes. What will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? Another, yet. A seventh. I see no more. And yet the eighth appears, who bears a glass which shows me many more. And some I see who twofold balls and treble scepters carry. Horrible sight. And now I see it is true. For the blood bolt at Banquo smiles on me and points at them for his. What? Is this so? Aye, sir, all this is so. But why stands Macbeth thus amazedly? Come, sisters, cheer we up his sprites and show the best of our delights. I'll charm the air to give a sound while you perform your antic round, that this great king may kindly say, our duties did his welcome pay. Where have they gone? At this pernicious hour stand I accursed in the calendar. Come in without there. What's your grace's will? Saw you the weird sisters. No, oh, my lord. Can they not buy you? No, indeed, my lord. Infected with the air were on they ride, and damned all those that trust them. I heard the galloping of horse. Who was came by? Tis two or three, my lord, that bring you word Macduff has fled to England. Fled to England? Aye, my good lord. Time now anticipates my dread exploits. The flighty purpose never was o'ertook unless the deed go with it. From this moment, the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand, and even now to crown my thoughts with acts, be it thought and done. The castle of Macduff I will surprise. Seize upon Fife, give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. No boasting like a fool. This deed I'll do before this purpose cool. But no more sights. Where are these gentlemen? Come bring me where they are. What had he done to make him fly the land? You must have patience, madam. He had none. His fright was madness. When our actions do not, our fears do make us traitors. You know not whether it was his wisdom or his fear. Wisdom? To leave his wife? To leave his babes, his mansions and his titles in a place from whence himself does fly? He loves us not. He wants the natural touch. For the poor wren, the most diminutive of birds will fight, her young ones in the nest against the owl. All is the fear. And nothing is the love. As little is the wisdom where the flight so runs against all reason. My dearest cousin, I pray you, school yourself. But for your husband, he is noble, wise, judicious, and best knows the fits of the season. I dare not speak much further. But cruel are the times when we are traitors and do not know ourselves. When we hold rumour from what we fear, yet know not what we fear, but float upon a wild and violent sea each way and move. 
I take my leave of you. Shall not be long, but I'll be here again. Things at the worst will cease. Nor else climb up to what they were before. My pretty cousin, blessings upon you. Fathered he is, and yet he's fatherless. I am so much a fool should I stay longer. It will be my disgrace and your discomfort. I'll take my leave at once. Sarah, your father's dead. And what will you do now? How will you live? As birds do, Mother. What? With worms and flies? With what I get, I mean, and so do they. Poor bird. Thou'd never fear the net nor lime, the pitfall nor the gin. Oh, why should I, Mother? Poor birds, they're not set for. My father is not dead, for all your saying. Yes, he is dead. How wilt thou do for a father? Nay, how will you do for a husband? Why? I can buy me twenty at any market. Then you'll buy them to sell again. Thou speakest with all thy wit, and yet if faith with wit enough for thee. Was my father a traitor, mother? Aye, that he was. What is a traitor? Why, one who swears and lies. And be all traitors that do so? Aye, every one that does so is a traitor and must be hanged. And must they all be hanged that swear and lie? Every one. Who must hang them? Why, the honest men. Then the liars and swearers are fools, for the liars and swearers in how to beat the honest men and hang up them. Now, God help thee, poor monkey. But how wilt thou do for a father? If he were dead, you'd weep for him. If he were not, it were a good sign that I should quickly have a new father. Poor Prattler, how thou talkest. Bless you, fair dame. I am not to you known, though in your state of honour I am perfect. I doubt some danger does approach you nearly. If you will take a homely man's advice, be not found here. Hence, with your little ones. Oh. To fright you thus, methinks I am too savage. To do worse to you, a fell cruelty which is too nigh your person. Heaven defend you. I dare abide no longer. Whither shall I fly? I've done no harm. Yet I remember now. I'm in this earthly world where to do harm is often laudable. To do good sometime accounted dangerous folly. Why then, alas, do I put up this womanly defence to say I have done no harm? What are these faces? Where is your husband? I hope in no place so unsanctified, as such as thou mayst find him. He's a traitor. Thou liest, thou shaggy villain! <laughs> oh! What you way, oh! young fry of treachery? <laughs> Mother, he has killed me. Run away, I pray you. Let us seek out some desolate shade. And there weep our sad bosoms empty. Let us rather hold fast the mortal sword, and like good men bestride our downfall and birthdom. Each new morn new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face, that it resounds as if it felt with Scotland, and yelled out like syllable of dolor. What I believe, I'll wail. What no, believe. And what I can redress, as I shall find the time to friend, I will. What you have spoke, it may be so, perchance. This tyrant, whose sole name blisters our tongues, was once thought honest. You have loved him well. He hath not touched you yet. I am young. But something you may deserve of him through me. And wisdom to offer up a weak, poor, innocent lamb to appease an angry god. I am not treacherous. But Macbeth is! A good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge. Why in that rawness left you wife and child, those precious motives, those strong knots of love without leave-taking? 
I pray you let not my jealousies be your dishonors, but mine own safeties. You may be rightly just, whatever I shall think. Bleed, bleed, poor country. Great tyranny lay thou thy basis sure, for goodness dare not check thee. Where thou thy wrongs, the title is afeard. Fare thee well, Lord. I would not be the villain that thou thinkst for the whole space that's in the tyrant's grasp, nor the rich east to boot. Be not offended. I speak not as in absolute fear of you. I think our country sinks beneath the yoke. It weeps, it bleeds, and each new day a gash is added to her wounds. I think withal there would be hands uplifted in my right. And here from gracious England have I offered of goodly thousands. But for all this, when I shall tread upon the tyrant's head, or wear it on my sword, yet my poor country shall have more vices than it had before, more suffer and more sundry ways than ever, by him that shall succeed. <laughs> What should he be? It is myself, I mean, in whom I know all the particulars of vice so grafted that when they shall be opened, black Macbeth will seem as pure as snow, and the poor state esteem him as a lamb being compared to my confineless harms. Not in the legions of horrid hell can come a devil more damned in evils to top Macbeth. I grant him bloody, luxurious, avaricious, false, deceitful, sudden, malicious, smacking of every sin that has a name. But there's no bottom, none, in my voluptuousness. Your wives, your daughters, your matrons and your maids could not fill up the cistern of my lust. And my desire, all continent impediments would all bear that did oppose my will. Better Macbeth than such an one to reign. Boundless intemperance in nature is a tyranny. It hath been the untimely emptying of the happy throne and fall of many kings. But do not fear to take upon you what is yours. With this there grows in my most ill-composed affection such a staunchless avarice that were I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands, desire his jewels in this other's house, and my more having would be as a source to make me hunger more, that I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. This avarice sticks deeper, grows with more pernicious root than summer seeming lust. And it hath been the sword of our slain kings. Yet do not fear, Scotland hath foisons to fill up your will of your mere own. All these are portable with other graces, way. But I have none! The king becoming graces! As justice, verity, temperance, stableness, devotion, patience, courage, fortitude. I have no relish of them but abound in the division of each several crime, acting it many ways. Nay, had I power. I should pour the sweet milk of concord into hell, uproar the universal peace, confound all unity on earth. Oh, Scotland, Scotland. If such an one be fit to govern, speak. I am as I've spoken. Fit to govern? No, not to live. O oh, nation miserable with an untitled tyrant, bloody sceptred, when shalt thou see thy wholesome days again? Since the truest issue of thy throne by his own condemnation stands accursed and does blaspheme his breed. Thy royal father was a most sainted king. The queen that bore thee, oftener upon her knees than on her feet, died every day she lived. Fare thee well. These evils thou repeatest upon thyself have banished me from Scotland. Macduff! This noble passion, child of integrity, hath from my soul wiped the black scruples, reconciled my thoughts to thy good truth and honor. Mm -hmm. Devilish Macbeth, by many of these trains, hath sought to win me into his power, and modest wisdom plucks me from over-credulous haste. But God above deal between thee and me, for even now I put myself to thy direction, and unspeak mine own detraction, here abjure the taints and blames I laid upon myself for strangers to my nature. I'm yet unknown to woman, never was forsworn, scarcely have coveted what was mine own. What I am, truly, is thine and my poor country's to command. Whither indeed before thy here oh. approach, all seaward with ten thousand men already at a point was setting forth. <laughs> now we'll together, and the chance of goodness be like our warranted quarrel. Why are you silent? <laughs> Such welcome and unwelcome things at once, tis hard to reconcile. <laughs> Say who comes here. 
Our countryman, and yet I know him not. <laughs> My ever gentle cousin. Welcome hither. I know him now. Good God, betimes remove the means that makes us strangers. Sir, amen. Stand Scotland where it did. Alas, poor country. Almost afraid to know itself. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave. Where nothing, but who knows nothing, is once seen to smile. Where sighs and groans and shrieks that rend the air are made, not marked. Where violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy. The dead man's knell is there, scarce asked for who. And good men's lives expire before the flowers in their caps, dying or ere they sicken. Oh, relation too nice and yet too true. What's the newest grief? <laughs> that of an hour's age doth hiss the speaker. Each minute teems a new one. How does my wife? Why, well, and all my children. Well, too. The tyrant has not battered at their peace. No. They were well at peace when I did leave them. Oh, be not a niggard of your speech. How goes? When I came hither to transport the tidings which I have heavily borne, there ran a rumour of many worthy fellows that were out, which was to my belief witnessed the rather for that I saw the tyrant's part of foot. Now is the time of help. Your eye in Scotland would create soldiers, make our women fight to doff their dire distresses. Be it their comfort, we are coming thither. Gracious England hath lent us good seaward in ten thousand men. An older and a better soldier none than Christendom gives out. Would I could answer this comfort with the like. But I have words that would be howled out in the desert air where hearing should not latch them. What concern they? The general cause, or is it a fee grief due to some single breast? No mind that's honest, but in it shares some woe. Though the main part pertains to you alone. If it be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly, let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue forever, which shall possess them with the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. I guess at it. Your castle is surprised. Your wife and babes savagely slaughtered. To relate the manner were on the quarry of these murdered deer to add the death of you. Merciful heaven. What man? Give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the off wrought heart and bids it break. Like my children, too. Wife. Children, servants, all that could be found. And I must be from thence. My wife killed too. I've said, be comforted. Let's make us medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. He has no children. All my pretty ones. Did you say all? Oh, hell kite. Oh, one all my pretty chickens and their dam at one fell swoop. Dispute it like a man. I shall do so. But I must also feel it as a man. I cannot but remember such things were that were most precious to me. Did heaven look on and would not take their part? Sinful Macduff, they were all struck for thee. Not that I am not for their own demerits, but for mine fell slaughter on their souls. Heaven rest them now. Be this the whetstone of your sword. Let grief convert to anger. Blunt not the heart. Enrage it. Oh, I could play the woman with mine eyes and brag it with my tongue. But gentle heaven cut short all intermission. Front to front, bring now this fiend of Scotland and myself within my sword's length. Set him! If he scape, heaven forgive him too! This tune goes manly. Come, go we to the king. Our power is ready, our lack is nothing but our leave. Macbeth is ripe for shaking, and the powers above put on their instruments. Receive what cheer you may. The night is long, that never finds the day. I have 
two nights watch with you, but can perceive no truth in your report? When was it she last walked? Since His Majesty went into the field. I have seen her rise from her bed, throw on her nightgown, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed, and yet all this while in a most fast sleep. A great perturbation in nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. In this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other actual performances, what at any time have you heard her say? That, so which I will not report after her. You may to me, and tis most meet you shall. to you, don't, not to anyone, having no witness to confirm my speech. No, you hear she comes. This is her very guise. And upon my life, fast asleep, observe her stentos. How came she by that light? Oh, it stood by her. She, she has light by her continually. It is her command. You see, her eyes are open. Aye. But their sense is shut. What is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. It is an accustomed action with her, to seem thus washing her hands. I have known her continue thus a quarter of an hour. Yet, here's a spot. Hark, she speaks. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Oh, damn it, spot. Oh, I say. One, two, why, then tis time to do it. Oh, it's murky. Fie, my lord, fie, a soldier and a feared. What need we fear who knows it? when none can call our power to a compt. Yet, who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? You mark that. <laughs> the Thane of Five had a wife. Where is she now? What? Will these hands never be clean? No more of that, my lord, no more of that. You mar all with this starting. Go to, go to. You have known what you should not. She has spoke what she should not, I am sure of that. Heaven knows what she has known. Yes, here's the smell of the blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh. 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 What a sigh is there. The heart is sorely charged. I would not have such a heart in my bosom for the dignity of the whole body. Well, well, well. Pray God it be, sir. This disease is beyond my practice. Yet I have known those which have walked in their sleep who have died holily in their beds. Uh -huh. Wash your hands. Put on your nightgown. And look not so pale. I tell you yet again, Banquo's buried. He cannot come out on his grave. Even so. To bed. To bed. There's knocking at the gate. Come. Come. Come, give me your hand. 
dan Kano Pianda. Too bad. Too bad. Too bad. Will she go now to bed? Directly. Foul whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infected minds to their death pillows will discharge their secrets. More Nietzsche the divine than the physician. God. God forgive us all. Look after her. Remove from her the means of all annoyance and still keep eyes upon her. So, good night. My mind, she has mated and amazed my sight. I think, but dare not speak. Good night, good doctor. The English power is near, led on by Malcolm, his uncle Seawood, and the good Macduff. Near Burnham Wood shall we well meet them. That way are they coming. Who knows if Donald Bain be with his brother? For certain, sir, he is not. I have a file of all the gentry. There is Seawood's son, and many unrough youths that even now protest their first of manhood. What does the tyrant? Great Dunsinane, he strongly fortifies. Some say he's mad, others that lesser hate him do call it valiant fury. But for certain, he cannot buttle his distempered cause within the belt of rule. Now does he feel his secret murders sticking on his hands. Now minutely revolts upbraid his faith breach. Those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. Now does he feel his title hang loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. Ah. Who then shall blame his pestered senses to recoil and start. When all that is within him does condemn itself for being there. Well, march we on. Give obedience where it is truly owed. Bring me no more reports, let them fly all! Till Burnham would remove the dunce and I cannot taint with fear. What's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? The spirits that know all mortal consequence have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth. No man that's born of woman shall e'er have power upon thee. And fly, false thanes, and mingle with the English epicures. The mind I sway by, and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt nor shake with fear. <laughs> the devil damn thee black, thou cream-faced loon. Where got thou that goose look? There is ten thousand... Geese, villain! Soldiers, sir! Go prick thy face and overread thy fear, thou lily-livered boy. What soldiers, patch? Death of thy soul. Those linen cheeks of thine are counsellors to fear. What soldiers, wayface? The English force, so please you. Now take thy face hence. <laughs> Satan! I'm sick at heart when I behold. Satan, I say! This push will cheer me ever or deceit me now. I've lived long enough. My way of life has fallen into the sear, the yellow leaf, and that which should accompany old age as honor, love, obedience, troops of friends I must not look to have, but in their stead, curses. Not loud, but deep. Mouth honor, breath, which the poor heart would fain deny and dare not. Satan! What's your grace's pleasure? What news more? All is confirmed, my lord, which was reported. I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Give me my armor. It is not needed yet. I'll put it on. Send out more horses, scare the country round. Hang those that talk of fear. Give me my armor. How does your patient, doctor? Not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick-coming fancies that keep her from her rest. Cure her of that. But canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow? Raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet, oblivious antidote cleanse the fraught bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart? Therein the patient must minister unto himself. Throw physic to the dogs, I'll none of it. Come, put my armor on. Seaton, send out. Doctor, the thanes fly from me. Come, sir, dispatch. 
If thou couldst, Doctor, cast the waters of my land, find her disease, and purge it to a sound and pristine health, I would applaud thee to the very echo that would applaud again. Bolt off, I say! What rhubarb, senna, or what purgative drug would scour these English hence? Hearst thou of them? Aye, my good lord. Your royal preparation makes us hear something. Bring it after me. I will not be afraid of death and bane till Burnham Forest come to Dunsinane. Were I from Dunsinane away and clear, profit again should hardly draw me here. Cousins, well met. I hope the days are near at hand. The chambers will be safe. And we doubted nothing. What wood is this before us? Well, the wood of Burnham. Let every soldier hew him down a bow and bear it before him. Thereby shall we shadow the numbers of our host and make discovery err in report of us. It shall be done. We learn no other but the confident tyrant keeps still in Dunsinane and will endure our setting down before it. It is his main hope. For where there is advantage to be gone, both more or less have given him the revolt. And none serve with him but constrained things, whose hearts are absent too. Let our just censures attend the true event and put we on industrious soldiership. The time approaches that will with due decision make us know what we shall say we have and what we owe. Thoughts speculative, their unsure hopes relate. But certain issues, strokes must arbitrate, towards which advance the war. Hang out our banners on the outward walls, the cry is still they come. Our castle strength will laugh a siege to scorn. Here let them lie till famine and the ague eat them up. Were they not forced with those that should be ours, we might have met them deaf, or beard to beard, and beat them backward home. What is that noise? It is the cry of women, my good lord. I'd almost forgot the taste of fears. A time has been my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek. And my fell of hair would have dis dismal treaties rouse and stir as life were into. I've supped full with horrors. Dionys familiar to my slaughterous thoughts can at once start me. Oh, wherefore was that cry? The Queen, my lord, is dead. <laughs> she should have died hereafter. There wouldn't have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out. Out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. How comes to use thy tongue, thy story, quickly? Gracious, my lord, I should report that which I say I saw, but know not how to do it. Well, say, sir. As I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham, and anon me thought that the wood began to move. Liar! And slave! Right, let me endure your wrath if it be not so! Within this three miles you may see it coming! I say a moving grove! If thou speaks false upon the next tree, shalt thou hang alive till famine cling thee! If thy speech be sooth, I care not if thou dost for me as much. I begin to pull in resolution. And doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not till burn the wood do come to Dunsinane. And now a wood comes toward Dunsinane. Arm! Arm and out! If it which he avouches does appear, there's no flying hence, nor tarrying here. Again, to be aweary of the sun. And wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell! Blow wind! Come rack! At least we'll die with harness on our back!
Now near enough. Your leafy screens throw down and show like those you are. You worthy uncle shall with my cousin, your right noble son, lead our first battle. Worthy Macduff and we shall take upon us what else remains to do, according to our order. Fare thee well. Do we but meet the tyrant's power tonight? Let us be beaten if we cannot fight. Make all our trumpets speak. Give them all breath. Those clamorous harbingers of blood and death. If time it was stake, I cannot fly. But bear like I must fight the course. What's he that was not born of woman? Such a one I am to fear or none. What is thy name? I'll be afraid to hear it. No, though thou calls thyself a hotter name than any is in hell. My name's Macbeth. The devil himself could not pronounce a title more hateful to mine ear. No, nor more fearful. Thou liest, abhorrent tyrant. And with my sword I'll prove the lie thou speak. Thou was born of woman, but swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn, brandished by man as of a woman born. Tyrant, show thy face! If thou be slain and by no stock of mine, my wife and children's ghosts will haunt me still. I cannot strike at wretched kerns whose arms are hired to bear their staves. Either thou, Macbeth, or else my sword with an unbattered edge I sheathe again, undeeded! Let me find him fortune and more I ask not! This way, my lord, the castle's gently rendered. The tyrant's people on both sides do fight. The noble thanes do bravely in the war. The day almost itself professes yours and little is to do. Why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword? Whilst I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. Turn, hellhound! Turn! Of all men else I have avoided thee. But get thee back, my soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I have no words. My voice is in my sword. Thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. Thou losest labour. As easy as may thou the intrenchant air with thy keen sword impresses make me bleed. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear a charmed life, which must not yield to one of woman born. Despair thy charm, and let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee. Macduff was from his mother's womb, untimely ripped. Is it be that tongue that tells me so? For it hath card my better part of man. And be these juggling fiends no more believed, but palter with us in a double sense, and keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. I'll not fight with thee. Then yield thee, coward, and live. To be the show and gaze of the time, we'll have thee as our rarer monsters are, painted upon a pole, and under it, here may you see the tyrant. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble's curse. Though Burnham would do come to Dunsinane, and our pose being of no woman born, yet I'll try the last. Before my body I throw my warlike shield. Lay on, Macduff, and damned be him that first cries hold. Enough! And with the friends we miss were safe arrived. Some must go off, and yet by these I see, so great a day as this is, cheaply bought. Macduff is missing, and your noble son. Your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. He only lived but till he was a man, the which no sooner had his prowess confirmed in the unshrinking station where he fought, but like a man he died. Then 
He is dead. Aye. And brought off the field. Your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. Had he his hurts before? Aye. On the front. Why then, God's soldier be ye. Had I as many sons as I have hairs, I would not wish them to a fairer death. And so his knell is nold. He's worth more sorrow, and that I'll spend for him. He's worth no more. They say he parted well and paid his score. And so, God be with him. Here comes newer comfort. Hail! King, for so thou art. Behold where stands a usurper's cursed head. The time is free. I see thee compassed with thy kingdom's pearl, that speak my salutation in their minds, whose voices I desire aloud with mine. Hail, King of Scotland! Hail, King of Scotland! We shall not spend a large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves and make us even with you. My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honour named. What's more to do, which would be planted newly with the time, as calling home our exiled friends abroad that fled the snares of watchful tyranny producing forth the cruel ministers of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, who as tis thought by self and violent hands took off her life. This, and what needful else that calls upon us, by the grace of grace, we will perform in measure, time and place. So, thanks to all at once and to each one whom we invite to see us crowned at school.